So previously we are studying about Mossberg spectroscopy and we have found that if I want to have a Mossberg spectroscopy, we actually need to have a source and that has to be bound to a solid matrix. Otherwise we cannot have that Mossberg effect due to the recoil. So we want to have a recoil less environment and for that I need to graft our source in a solid matrix. Similar thing should be also happening to the sample. So this is the source. This is the sample that I'm going to look into. And at the end, we have a detector. And what is actually happening? They're all put on a stage where the detector and the sample typically are actually bolted, so they don't move. However, the source is put on a wheel where you can actually move it backward or forward, and you can also even measure its velocity. Plus V means it is coming towards the sample, minus V means it is going around the sample. And what happens, it actually gives the gamma ray and then depending on whether it is absorbing or not you can detect it in the detector so what happens what we found that there are different possibilities that there depending on what is the sample absorbance feature so this is energy versus absorbance and say this is the source one and the source energy I can modulate by changing the velocity because I can include a Doppler effect of that. And depending on that, there are say like five different condition if I think about say one, two, three, four, five. And in the fifth condition, it says that it actually matched perfectly with the absorbance feature of the sample. And then if I want to plot it with respect to percentage of transmittance of gamma ray that has been detected in the detector versus the velocity I'm moving. So what I'm going to see that it is going to have a feature like this. So say this is number one point position where is nothing is happening. Number two position, a little bit of happening due to this overlap. Number three is the maximum because everything is absorbed. Number four again, a very little overlap. And number five again, no overlap. So that is how the signal typically looks like for a MOSBUS spectroscopy. So that we have gone into the details of it and I found out, we found out like how it is happening. Now the question is why the source and sample, although they are exchanging their energy between I equal to three half and I equal to half, for the source and I equal to half to I equal to three half for the sample, why they are not really matching? Why they are a little bit different for the sample and source? And the answer is lying on the effect of electron density on the nucleus. And last day we have gone into the details out of four different orbitals that you can have S, P, D, F. Among them, only the S orbital can have some finite possibility to present inside a nucleus. And if you remember, we have gone through this thing called radial distribution function. And from there, we figured it out that yes, there is a finite possibility for only the s orbitals. And you can look into the wave functions, how it is given, and you can find for the s orbitals, if r equal to zero value, if I put, that means that nucleus, the wave function doesn't vanish. It does vanish for p, d, and f, but for s orbitals, it doesn't vanish. So there is a finite possibility that your electron is 
actually staying inside the nucleus. And that we have found. And with respect to that, we try to figure it out. OK, the S orbital can be there. So what is the effect of the S orbital on the nucleus? And over there, we assume this is my nucleus and this is the electron density that we are having around the nucleus. So this is the nucleus and this is the electron density. And over there, only the S electron density can be present inside this. And over here, if I have two assumptions, basically they are two different parts of the same assumption. First is that the nucleus is spherical. And the second thing is the radius of the nucleus is R. Then what we are going to have, we are going to have something called a monopole interaction. A monopole interaction is a Coulombic interaction because there is a positive charge present in that nucleus, which is going to get affected by the electron density present into it. And that can be represented by this Hamiltonian. So previously, when we talk about Hamiltonian, we think about what is the effect of nucleus on the electron. Now we are looking into the other way. We are looking what is the effect of electron on nucleus. So the Hamiltonian says that what you're going to have is the following 2 by 5 pi. These are coming for the condition that we have assumed that nucleus is spherical. So that's why these particular terms are coming. Then comes the Z e square is for the nucleus charge. Then psi zero square, that is the electron density inside the nucleus into R square. Okay, R is the radius of the nucleus. So over here, this ZE. So let me go to the next slide. So again, I am writing this full equation 2 by 5 by Z square, psi 0 square into R square. Over here, a term ZE is actually coming for the nuclear charge. Where Z, you can see it is nothing but the atomic number. That means how many protons are present. That is going to give you the positive charge. Psi 0 square gives you the electron density inside the nucleus. And actually it is given by minus E into psi 0 square. So those E and this E over here, that's why you get an E square term. And this negative term is actually getting cancelled because you are talking about a monopole. So first you have to start with a negative term over here, but which is getting cancelled with the negative charge of the electron. So they are getting cancelled. So you have a positive term altogether. So that is the Hamiltonian of a S electron density effect on the nucleus. Right. So now here comes the issue. So you have a ground state and electronic state. So say we are talking about iron 57 system from now on. So ground state means I equal to half. Excited state means I equal to three half. So if there is no base electron density present, no matter what system I am taking, I am going to get the same energy gap between the excited state and the ground state. If there is no effect of the electronic state. No effect of the S electrons. But in reality there is. So there is S electrons have finite possibility that it is actually penetrating into the nucleus. So that's why the ground state and excited state is not going to be same they are going to change their energy. And as they are going to change their energy, the energy gap is not going to be the same. So say it is the ideal energy gap what it should be, but now my energy gap is this, E source. 
And this, how much it is changing, it depends on how much S electron density you're allowing it to be in. Similarly, what is happening in the sample, that can be also in a different position. So there's ground state and excited state for sure. But due to the presence of this S electron density, the energy gap is not remaining the same. So over here, what I'm trying to say, E sample is not equal to E source. And that is why we have to balance that energy gap between the sample and source by creating a Doppler effect, by moving the source towards or away from the sample. And that is happening because of the effect of the electron density. And that is why we have to know how to connect them together. How the S electron density can be connected with respect to the energy of the nucleus state. So, so far we are already having one of the fact over there that this Hamiltonian is giving me an idea that the S electron density has something to say on the nuclear and this nucleus over is going to be present there. Now, if I say that there are two different systems, one is the source and one is the sample. So say there is my source and here is my sample. And say they are not the same molecular identity. They're both iron, but not molecularly same. Say one is iron chloride, one is iron sulfate. So how much that is going to affect it? So that what we can do specifically differentiate that energy with respect to the S electron density. And what I'm going to get is a difference in energy of the source and sample. And that is given by this equation. 4 by 5 z is square r square delta r by r psi zeros sorry psi zero square of sample minus psi zero square of source so let's go slowly. What do I mean by this particular equation? This equation is saying that if you have a sample and source, and if there is an energy difference present between the energy gap of the source and sample. So this delta value is nothing, but what it is saying that, say this is my ground state, and excited state. So what I am basically drawing, the ground state and excited state energy difference for the source, and say the sample is different. So say this is E source, and this is E sample. So this delta value is a function of this E sample minus E source. Okay, so that is what I'm trying to figure it out over here. And that is given by this term delta. What is the actual name of that? I'll come into a little bit later. But this delta value defines what will be the difference of energy between the sample and source. And what are the parameters that is going to be different over here? So if we look into here, what are the parameters that is going to be differed are these two terms. One is this one. And one is this one. So first come into this particular term, psi zero square sample minus psi zero square source. What is giving it? Basically it is saying, what is the difference of S electron density inside the nucleus. So if you can measure the S electron density between the sample 
and also the reserve density inside the source, whatever the difference is, that is going to be this particular term. And say your source and samples are actually basically the same thing. These terms become zero and you will not see any difference between the source and sample energy gap. Okay, so that is given by this particular term. Now what is delta R by R? Now that is very interesting. What it is actually given delta R value is that difference in the radius in the excited state minus ground state. So what it is saying that when you are changing the nuclear state from I half to I three half, is it always true that the nucleus remaining almost same? Can it also change its nuclear radius? And the answer is yes, it can change its nuclear radius. It can shrink down or it can expand. If it expands, that means excited state radius will be higher than the ground state. So delta R will be a positive term. But if it shrinks down, that means excited state is smaller than the ground state, it will be a negative term. And over here, this delta R by R term defines what are the changes you are seeing with respect to the nuclear size. So it is a change in the nuclear size or nuclear radius. And this term depends on the particular atom you are taking. Because depending on the particular atom or isotope, I should say, particular isotope, say like 57 iron, in the case of 57 iron, this value is negative. Why? Because in case of 57, the excited state radius, that means at i equal to 3 by 2, is actually smaller in size than in the ground state, i equal to half. So that is why this value will be negative. So these are the two parameters that can be changed during the transition. One is the S electron density difference. One is the change in the radii of the system. Any question so far? Please go ahead. So this is very important. Like what are the changes can happen that can affect that the excited state and the ground state energy gap can be different from source to sample. And what we found, there are two important factors. One is this delta R by R, and one is this difference in the S electron density. Now, delta R by R can be changed, but that has minimal effect with respect to what is happening around the nucleus, whether the electron density is changing, increasing, that doesn't matter. It only says that the delta R by R, whether it will be positive or negative. For iron, it is negative. If you go for 119 teen, it is positive. So this value becomes positive. That means in this case of 119 teen, the excited state has a higher radii compared to the ground state. That's all. So it actually defines what will be the signature of it, like it's a negative or positive. However, it doesn't really matter too much what will be the absolute value of it. It just defined it is will be positive or negative. But the absolute value will be depend on the difference between the sample and source A C electron density. OK, so that is why the electron density or S electron density can matter and can affect that the value can be different. OK, and that is why if I go back a little bit over there, you can see the sample and the source will be different and that is why we are actually have to move the source back and forth so to match the sample. Because the source and sample cannot be same all the time due to the change in the S electron density. So now if I want to find out if I have an iron, what should be the trend of this change? Which side I should move around? That will be totally dependent on this particular value of the S electron density. So that will be our concern from now on. 
So this one is electron density that I am going to look into. Now, how the S electron density can matter? So again, I am taking iron as an example. So if I look into iron, there are 26 electrons. If I start from the atomic uh, state of the iron atom, so say I am taking a iron atom, a single iron atom in gaseous state with 26 electrons. What would be the electronic configuration? You are doing that from seven standard right now it is. So it will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 3d8. That we actually write it down, right? So, so if I write it correctly, so let me write down 2, 2, 4, 10, 12, 16. Electron 10, 18, 8. Huh? So that is the 26 electrons you can have over there. However, when I'm writing it, I'm writing at 3d8. But previously, you guys have probably studied it is 3d6, 4s2. Right? Because we are also writing 4s2. So over here, you have to understand it depends on which particular condition I'm talking about. If it is an iron atom in gaseous state in such a way that this iron atom is not interacting with anything else, then only it can be 3D6, 4S2. Any other condition, even in metallic state, it is going to have a configuration of 3D8, 4S0. Why? Because it depends on the energy. of the orbitals. So say I'm looking into two different states. One is the atomic gaseous state and one in a molecular interaction when the atom is following a molecule. So in the atomic condition, what happens? The 4s orbital has lower energy than 3d. So that is why 4s orbital get accumulated first so that is why we get over here 4s2 3d6 however as you start forming the molecules the d orbitals have better overlap higher interaction so it gets stabilized on the other hand 4s orbital is not so much so it get higher in energy so in a molecule 3d has lower energy compared to 4s so that is why it goes to 3d8 4s0 system okay and that is why we are going to look into this configuration mostly 